We have an amazing day today that's going to kind of be bookended by Tom Friedman, our next speaker. And, and Tom Friedman, I'm going to introduce you and say a few things about him, but he, he grew up in Minnesota. He lives here now in the D.C. area. But tonight, we are inviting all of you and trying to take all of you a few blocks away to the Planet Word Museum. This is an amazing museum. If you haven't been there, you'll see it. It's, whatever I'm hyping it up, it lives up to a type. Only two other things have lived up to their hype. LeBron James and Hamilton. <laughs> Planet Word will be the third to that list. But this museum was the brainchild of Tom Freeman's wife, who is not here, but maybe she'll join us next year. Uh, and together they built this amazing museum uh, promoting literacy and, and, and beauty of language, and, and you'll, you'll see that. But why, is he, why does he do that? So he is the... the well-accomplished, well-regarded uh, foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. He's had that role since 1995. He's won three Pulitzer Prizes, uh, which is the highest award you can win in journalism. I think he won two before he was 35, so if anybody here is 35, I don't know what you're up to, but, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what he was doing. Um, he's also written many books that he's a New York Times best-selling author, and when you get that label, it's not just because he works for the New York Times. He, if you sell enough books, you, you get to make that list. He's done that multiple times. Many people, including myself, have entire bookshelves in their, how, in their homes just of Tom Friedman books. Uh, if you haven't read them, now after today, you're going to go out and buy all his books. But his books become like instant classics that everyone is required on, uh, and lots of topics to read. And what made him so qualified to write all these books, and he explains in his foreign affairs column, like, I, I will say, it, I'll describe it this way, and I read him pretty religiously, you know, he explains the world to leaders and explains leaders to the world. And he, before he was a columnist, I, I know from his bio, he was uh, the bureau chief in Lebanon during a civil war. He was the bureau chief for the New York Times in Israel and Jerusalem. He was the White House correspondent. He was the State Department correspondent. He also wrote about international economics. And he has this position where he sees all the threads and trends of going on in the world and could tie them together and explain it to those of us who don't have the time to think about it as deeply as he does. So that is a great gift that he gives to all of us. Uh, and so just to say that his, uh, his daughter was a, a teacher, his wife was a teacher, uh, and then on a point of personal privilege yesterday, uh, I shared a little bit that I grew up in a house that cared a lot about summer programs, I said. Uh, my father grew up in a family of teachers in Detroit, ended up moving to uh, Minneapolis, and probably in his 20s started running a camp in Wisconsin, mostly for kids from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, and then later on, was an entrepreneur, moved, moved to New York City, met my mom, they settled in New Jersey. And uh, so there were two things that mattered in my house. One was summer programs, the other was the New York Times. My dad was a religious fanatic reader of the New York Times, so much so that I can remember if there would be a snowstorm, my dad would make me go shovel the driveway, not so we could get our car out of the house, but so we could find the New York Times. He's like, go find it, it's somewhere in the snow. And then, and then on 11 o'clock at night, I'd be really, I was a little kid. He's like, come with me. I'm like, where are we going? He's like, we have to go to the store to get the Sunday New York Times when it comes out at 1030 at night because I want to start reading it now because it's so big and I don't, it's going to take me so long. And, like, and then our whole family would be reading it. And then our family would only pretty much have dinner together on Friday nights. And my dad, who, uh, his name was Maurice, he went by his childhood nickname Moish, and everybody knew him. He was a big personality. He was six feet tall, and at a certain point he got six, six feet wide as well. Uh, and we'd have, he'd sit there, and he'd have this big dinner, and he would say, and I would, he would encourage me to invite my high school friends over, and he would say, hey, Joe, tell me what you know. And it was very intimidating. Like, and you could say anything. He didn't care what you said. He just, you, you had to be involved. And then the second question was, what do you think about what Tom Friedman wrote this week? And my friends, before they would come over for dinner, would like run to the school library and be like, quick, we got to read the paper before Aaron's dad grills us. And my friend Jeremy would come in and be like, Mr. Dworkin. He's like, yes, Jeremy. He's like, did you hear about the hippopotamuses that were killed in Africa this week? He's like, no, no I did not know that. Please tell me more. Uh, so, so this is what it was like. Uh, and he's not alive today. Uh, but at a certain point, he went to go hear Tom Friedman give a, a lecture about one of his books, uh, of Tom's books, and my dad goes up to, you know, maybe get it signed, to introduce, and somehow they make the connection, and, and my dad, somehow they are talking, this is a story that was folklore, but I just had it confirmed this morning, that, that my dad said, that, that realized that Tom Friedman, as a camper, went to the camp that my dad was the director of. 
<laughs> and my dad was so proud of this. He was more proud of that than almost anything else his own children every day. And he would tell everybody the story. And I, it wasn't until just 10 minutes ago that I confirmed, is this true? Did you really go? But he was so proud, and he'd be so proud at this full circle moment that I'm joining all of you uh, in community, promoting summer learning experiences for more kids, which he cared about, and that he would think we were very wise to take the advice and listen to the guidance of Tom Freeman. So thank you, Tom, for being here. Come on. What a great introduction. Man, that was, that's awesome, you know. Uh, I am going to talk today, um, I haven't given this talk very much because it's about a new book I'm working on. Uh, and it's called How to Write a Column. Because we live in an age where everybody wants to be a columnist, whether on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. So I thought I'd write a book about how I do it, how, how it's done. But it's, it's a little more than that. It's, it's really a book about my OODA loop. You may have heud the term OODA loop, O-O-D-A. Um, and it's actually a term coined by an Air Force pilot, a fighter pilot. And he said, if your OODA loop is faster than the other pilot's OODA loop, you will win in a dogfight. Because OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And that's really what a columnist has to do day to day. We've got to observe, we've got to orient, we've got to decide, we've got to act. We act by, by writing a column. And so really what I want to talk to you today is about my, my OODA loop. And I'm going to go through sort of four sections. One is uh, why I write. Um, the second is how I learn. The third is what I learned. The fourth is what I saw. And actually, the fifth is what I think it means. So hopefully I can pull all these together. Every time I try to do this, I'm, I'm reminded of the joke about uh, when they built the channel under the English Channel. You know, they dug that channel, you know, between the London and Paris, basically. And uh, they put it out to bid. And when they put it out to bid, they got bids of three billion pounds, three and a half billion pounds, 3.4 billion pounds. One bid came in for 100,000 pounds from the firm of Goldberg and Cohen in the Upper East Side of London. So for fiduciary reasons, they had to go check it out. Sent a team out there, knocked on the door. Mr. Cohn answered. Goldberg was on the road. They said, Mr. Cohn, how can you build a channel for 100,000 pounds? He said, what's the problem? Goldberg will start on one side, Cohn will start on the other with a shovel, and we'll dig until we meet. <laughs> the guy said, what if you don't meet? So you'll have two tunnels. OK, so, so you may have one speech today. You may have two. You may have three. You may have four. I, I'm hoping they're going to meet, OK? So let me start by talking about first uh, um, really about why I write? Why do I write? Um, and I write for, for several reasons. Um, the, the first reason I, I write is um, I write actually to learn. Um, I don't know about you all, but I actually learn by sticking my hands in the clay. And when I write a book, I think of it as a big block of granite, and I chip away at it. I start with an intuition. It feels like the world is flat. And I chip away at it, and I see an elbow. And then I see an ear. And then I see a knuckle. And I chip away some more. For me, writing is an iterative process of learning. And I'm always going back and forth. That's the only way I know how to write. And all my books really just started with an intuition. I always tell people, I don't write my books. I discover my books. And it's only by writing. Whenever I run into people, sometimes journalists will say to me, you know, I, I don't do reporting anymore. I just do analysis. My answer always is, you're your analysis probably isn't very good then, because all my ideas actually come from my reporting. It's only when you're in the middle of something. One of the tragedies of America today is we, got, we so got out of manufacturing, so got out of putting our hands on things, that I think it also affects our ability to innovate. So the first reason I write is actually to learn. The second reason I write is I like to teach. I, every journalist who goes into journalism has some I hope, inspiration, some sense of idealism, why they're doing that. And for me, my idealism is that I actually like to explain things. Um, I really like to understand the plumbing and wiring of things and then explain it to people. 
Um, you know, we, we live in an age, basically, where, um, you know, Marie Curie had a motto about this, the great um, doctor and scientist. She said, now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. Now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. And we live in an age where it is now a business, a huge business, to make people stupid and angry. It's a business. And my idealism is to fight that business by trying to break down complex things into simple bites that I can understand and then share them with others in the hope that if they understand more, they will, they will fear less. When people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I'm a translator from English to English, okay? <laughs> I take really complex subjects, break them down so I can understand, and then share them with others. Because we live in an age, and I'm going to go into that a little bit, where it is, things are so complex, so intertwined, that it can be overwhelming for people, and then they fall prey to people with a simple message. Just build a wall. Just build a wall. It'll all be fine, okay? And my idealism is really to be an explainer. Um, the third reason I write is because I believe in some things. I believe in pluralism. I believe in inclusion. Um, I believe in democracy. And the great privilege I have is to be able to have a megaphone in the New York Times to promote those ends. And that leads to the fourth reason I write. It's because I, I need the eggs. Maybe if any of you saw the movie Annie Hall, it's an old movie now, Woody Allen movie, where he tells a joke at the end of the movie, the guy goes to a doctor, he says, doctor, doctor, I've got a terrible problem. My brother thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, well, just tell him he's not a chicken. The guy says, I can't, I need the eggs. Okay, so, so there, is, there is something irrational about it. You know, a couple months ago, I've been writing a lot about Ukraine, obviously. I woke up on a Sunday morning at 4.30, and this happens to me sometimes, and a column has just written itself in my head. I wake up and I can see it, paragraph by paragraph by paragraph. I once heard the singer Paul Simon say, you know, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and, and I'm just taking dictation. I'm just taking dictation from the big guy. And that's, I have those moments sometimes. I, when I have those moments, what I did was jump out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, go to my computer, and I wrote that column. And your best columns, by the way, take you as long as it takes your fingers to hit the keys, because they come from a really deep place. The muse is in residence, okay? 8.30, I called my editors, column was done, like the idea. By 2.30, it was on the homepage of the New York Times, being shared with 10 million people around the world. That is the most fun you can have legally that I know of, okay? <laughs> All right? Um, you, you wake up with an idea, you write it up, and 12 hours later, it's being shared all over the world. And that's something that also really uh, motivates and inspires me. Now, why did I go into journalism? Well, it's a little relevant to your, more than relevant to your program. The first reason I went into journalism was because... Um, I had that teacher. Yeah, I had that teacher in 10th grade at St. Louis Park High School outside of Minneapolis. Let's give it up for St. Louis Park over here. Thank you, all right. Um, small suburb outside of Minneapolis. Um, room 313, her name was Hattie Steinberg. I actually, when I went to you know, high school in 10th grade, I actually wanted to be a professional golfer, but it was no chance of that happening. And um, uh, I took Hattie's class and um, uh, she inspired me so much to be a journalist. It's the only journalism course I've ever taken. Uh, at room 313 in St. Louis Park High School, not because I was that good, but because she was that good. And Hattie at the time was 62 years old, um, but she was a woman of principles and fundamentals, and she was a strict disciplinarian. I, I stand up a little straighter just thinking about her, okay? <laughs> but we hung around her room like it was the malt shop and she was Wolfman Jack. <laughs> because we loved that sense, I loved that sense of how to do things right. And um, uh, I, I thank God I, I intersected with this woman because she really inspired me and she taught me that a real journalist starts their day with the New York Times. Um, and never did I think I'd be, I'd be writing for it later, but, uh, but lo and behold, um, here I am. So um, I actually got my start in journalism, though. I, I wrote for my high school paper, 
And I wrote a little in college, um, but I actually, I actually had a very weird career. I started as a columnist. And um, I started because I was in London for graduate school, and I'd met uh, my girlfriend then, uh, my girlfriend now wife, and we were walking down the street in London in 1975 in the Paleolithic era, and, um, uh, <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Carter was running against Gerald Ford for president. And the Evening Standard, which is the afternoon paper in London, they always have these blaring headlines, you know, Brad to Jen, we're finished, you know. And um, <laughs> uh, this headline um, said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to fire Dr. K. I stopped my then girlfriend, now wife, and said, look at that, that headline. Uh, Jimmy Carter's running for president. He's trying to win Jewish votes by promising to fire the first ever Jewish secretary of state. That's really, that's really kind of odd. And I have no idea what inspired me, but I went back to my dorm and I wrote a column about it. And um, my then girlfriend, now wife, happened to be a neighbor of Gilbert Cranberg, who was the editorial page editor of the Des Moines Register. And my then girlfriend, now wife, took that column home on Christmas vacation and gave it, walked it over to Gil Cranberg's house and he liked it, and they printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with an Alf cartoon, and they paid me $50. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. I was walking down the street, I had an opinion, I wrote it up, and someone paid me $50. And I was, I was really hooked uh, ever after. That, and that's really, um, why, I, why I write. How do I learn? Because a, a column is really two things. Um, I can teach you how to uh, write a news story. I can teach anyone in this room how to write a news story. But I can't teach you how to write a column. Because a news story is physics. And column writing is chemistry. Okay? That is, um, a news story, you're responding to something out external to you. But a column has to come up internally inside of you and then be shared with the world. And so your, your column is a combination of basically, I believe, how you lean and how you learn. So how do you lean into the world? And then how do you learn about the world? And it's really the fusion of those two things. Well, the way I, my politics, those who read my column know, is I'm, I'm really a pretty you know, centrist guy, probably called a, 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 a moderate Democrat. And that comes from having grown up in Minnesota in the 50s and 60s in a time and place when politics worked. My mom was a radical liberal, but for 12 straight elections, she voted for Bill Frenzel, the Republican congressman from our district, who used to just run with a billboard on Highway 100 through St. Louis Park, and all it said was Frenzel for Congress and never even said what party he was from. Hard to believe there, there was a time like that. Um, I, Minneapolis was a really moderate place. It's gone through its struggles now, we know. But when I grew up there, um, my dad, I remember one day came home and my dad had a friend, <laughs> he was in the mafia and um, he got arrested. And um, my dad came home one day and said that his friend had gotten sent to jail, and I was five years old at the time, and I thought, God, my dad knows someone who went to jail. I said, Dad, what did he do? He said, well, son, he was, he was shopping in a store before it was open. Um, <laughs> um, so that was, that was Minnesota for breaking and entering, okay? Um, I was uh, at a wedding a couple years back. I, I went home and my friend uh, ran to my friend Jay and, um, uh, and his, his wife Eileen, and, and they had come to the wedding and they were a little frazzled. And um, uh, Jay said that Eileen had been driving uh, on the highway and someone almost drove her off the road. And she came back and said, Jay, I was so mad I almost honked. Okay. <laughs> That's Minnesota for road rage, okay. <laughs> So that was kind of the, I grew up with a, with a moderate politics. That's how I leaned, always looking for the center, always looking to bring people together. How did I learn? So I learned by going to the edge, because all the best learning happens at the edge. That's when you really see things in stark relief. I learned by going to the edge of three different realms. 
I first went to the edge, by the way, I only understood this 40 years later. I wish I could have told you 40 years ago. I said, this is how I shall learn, um, but uh, it doesn't quite work that way. But this is looking back and realize I had developed a method of learning. And it was to go to the edge of three different realms, because it's the edge not only where you get to see things in stark relief, but you get to name things. It feels like the world is flat out here, because you're out at the edge of the story. So the first edge I went to was the edge of human behavior. Uh, I lived in a civil war in Beirut for almost five years, uh, between 1979 and 1984. Um, and um, I got to see human molecules behave at really high temperatures. Um, in a way you could never really see anywhere else. I get to see what human beings are capable of for extreme evil uh, and amazing kindness and generosity under huge pressure. And Beirut taught me to be an anthropologist because in Beirut there was no data. The only data was talking to another human being. And so um, I learned that talking to another human being is data. Now that may sound odd to some of you, but there's a whole trend in journalism of being a data journalist, okay? I am not a data journalist. Um, I learn by actually talking to other people, which I really enjoy. And you learn that when you live in a city where there is no data. I, I confessed in my book from Beirut to Jerusalem that when I was there as the UPI wire reporter, which was before I was at the New York Times, we had to file the weather highlights you know, you, in those days, you went to the newspaper to see what the weather was going to be in Beirut, Bucharest, Baltimore, and, um, and it was the high and the low. Well, that was because the wire service reporters in those cities went to the weatherman and got the high and the low. But in Beirut, there, there was no weatherman, at least that I knew of. So I made up the weather report. Um, <laughs> I would say to my colleague, Ahmed, how did it feel out there today? Oh, Mr. Tom, a little hot today. Around 80? Yeah, Mr. Tom, 80. High in Beirut, 80. Yeah, Ahmed, last night, how did it feel? Oh, Mr. Tom, cool last night, okay? 60, 62, 62, low 62, and thus was the weather report filed from Beirut. Um, uh, but to this day, um, uh, if any of you were around me standing in a line, I interview people wherever I go. I think everybody has a story to tell. And I love listening to people's stories, the crazy things they fear, they aspire, they love, they hate. That's how I learn. And that's what I've always said, to be a successful journalist, you have to actually like people. Um, unfortunately, a lot of journalists actually don't like people, okay? Um, because if you like people, they like you back in the sense that they open up to you and they share with you amazing things. So the first edge I went to was the edge of human behavior. Second edge I went to was the edge of technology. So I developed a habit, not quite sure how I fell into this, where I would go to big companies, cutting edge companies, um, you know, Microsoft or, or Walmart or AT&T or Apple or in, in my most you know, uh, celebrated case, Infosys in India, an outsourcing company. And I would say to their CEO, uh, don't care about your salary, your stock price, your earnings, um, your successor just want to do two things. I want to hang out in your research lab. I want to know what's going on at the tip of your spear, because if you want to understand the future, hang around with people who are inventing it. And I want to hang out in your HR department. I want to know how you're training your people for the tip and future you're inventing. Because my intuition was this would be coming to a neighborhood near me. And that brought me to Bangalore, India in 2004 to a company called Infosys, at the time the leading outsourcing company in the world. I spent two weeks there really seeing amazing outsourcing going on. This was early in, in that phenomena. I discovered my, my lost luggage on Delta, Delta Airlines was being traced from Bangalore, that, that uh, my cartoons were being drawn up in Baltimore, that my medicines were being packaged in, 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 uh, in uh, Bangalore. And the last day I met with Nanda Nilakani, who was then the CEO of Infosys, and he was a friend of mine, and I was so amazed what I'd seen in two weeks. I had my laptop on my lap. We were preparing, it was gonna be a filmed interview. And at one point, Nanda said to me, Tom, I've gotta to tell you, the global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Oh, I wrote that down on my little laptop. The global economic <laughs> playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Finished the interview, got back in my Jeep, um, took an hour's ride from Infosys to my hotel in Bangalore, and all the way I'm stirring in my head, the global economic playing field is being leveled. Wow, it's like he's telling me it's been flattened. Oh my God, India's premier engineer entrepreneur 
just told me the world is flat. And I wrote that down in my notebook, the world is flat. I got back to the Lila Hotel, I ran up to my bedroom, I called my wife in Washington, and I said, honey, I am gonna write a book called The World is Flat. She now says she thought that was a brilliant idea, okay? <laughs> if you run into her at Planet Word, ask her if that's really what she thought, okay? So the second edge I went to is the, is the edge of technology. Third edge I went to is the edge of nature. I've had the privilege um, of traveling the world for the last 25 years with Conservation International, an amazing um, environmental NGO, and I visited every pristine ecosystem on the planet. The US Navy took me on their ice exercise in a submarine beneath the Arctic. I get to do really cool stuff. I did it first to learn about nature, and then I did it to learn from nature. Because I came to realize that this globalization thing I was writing about was so complex and intertwined the only thing that mirrored it in its complexity was the natural world. So if you understood what made for a healthy ecosystem in nature and which ecosystems thrive when the climate changed, it might give you an insight into what makes for a healthy community and which one of those thrive when the climate changes. And, um, uh, and, the, and the answer to that, what they have in common, is nature calls them complex adaptive networks where all the elements of the ecosystem network together in an unconscious way, in an emergent way, to um, preserve their, uh, to energize their, their propulsion um, uh, and, 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 and basically resilience. And the healthy communities today actually do the same thing. They have what I call complex adaptive coalitions where the community comes together, business, labor, social entrepreneurs, government, teachers, philanthropists, and they build a complex adaptive coalition. And so my views, which I'll get a little more deeper now, you need to understand they really emerge by studying nature because she's an amazing mentor. So then what I did was I arbitraged all three of those together. And that's how I look at the world. I lean, you know, toward inclusion, toward the center, toward trying to help people get along. But my views really emerge from natural systems. And so I'll give you a small example. I actually got my BA and graduate degree from Oxford in Arabic. Um, so like, what am I doing here? That's a long story, okay. But that's what got me to the Middle East. Now, if we could reach back in history and, and grab that Tom Friedman from Oxford in 1976 and bring him forward to today and ask him, hey, Tom, what just happened in Syria? last five years. Well, that Tom Friedman would tell you, well, they had a coup. It was like when Adib Shishakli overthrew Muhammad Jones, you know. Um, I'd have given you a very one-dimensional answer. If you ask this Tom Friedman what happened in Syria over the last six years, he'll tell you that Syria experienced the worst drought in its modern history from 2006 to 2010. A million Syrian farmers and herders left their homes, flocked to the cities, overwhelmed the infrastructure. Assad did nothing for them. Then they got on these things called cell phones and watched the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, and then they blew the lid off the place. So it was the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law all converging together. And if you don't look at the world in 3D, which is, I look at everything in 3D, what's going on in the environment, technology, and, and human behavior, you're really never gonna see the story. So that's, that's how I learn. What are the biggest lessons I learned? Wow, there's a lot. But the biggest lesson I've learned is that the single most powerful human emotions are humiliation and dignity. I've basically spent 40 years as a journalist, reporter, and columnist covering people acting out on their sense of humiliation and questing for dignity. Uh, and whether it was you know, Palestinians versus Israelis, Muslim youth in Europe versus the Christian you know, majority, China, after what the Chinese called a century of humiliation, or Vladimir Putin humiliated by the end of the Soviet Union, I am actually the New York Times humiliation and dignity correspondent. And I actually changed my card five years ago, and that's what it says, okay? <laughs> because basically all I do is observe people acting out on their sense of humiliation and questing for dignity and recognition. 
And that leads to my second rule. My second rule, and it's actually the title of my book, is what you say when you listen. What you say when you listen. See, I was, a, I was a little Jewish kid from Minnesota who wanted to cover the Arab Muslim world in the 1970s. That was not a natural thing, okay? Um, at that time, the New York Times didn't let a Jewish person cover Israel or uh, Lebanon or the Middle East or the Arab world. And I had to fight my way into that. And if you read my stuff, you'll know that um, I'm not a pushover for anybody. I'm not out there all saying, you're all great, you're all wonderful, it's all the other guy's fault. No, I'm actually in people's face a lot. But they know one thing about me, and it's true. I want them to succeed. I'm not there to put them down. And anything I write that's critical is because I want them to realize their full potential. And the way I learned to convey that was by being a good listener. Because two things happen when you listen. One is what you hear when you listen, what you learn when you listen. All the stories I got wrong were because I was talking when I should have been listening. But much more important is what you say when you listen, because listening is a sign of respect. And it's amazing what people will say to you and share with you if they think you respect them. And if they don't think you respect them, you cannot tell them the sky is blue. And so that's been my survival mechanism all of these years. Be a good listener. I'll go into a room sometime, whether it's Arabs or Israelis, they got my columns all printed out, they're ready to carve me up. And I will spend an hour listening to them, deep listening, not just waiting for people to stop talking, but deep listening. I'll push back too. And by the end of the hour, a lot of them will have their cell phones out and they want to get a picture with you. Because all they really want to do is to be heard. That's just true of so many people to be heard and respected by someone who thinks that they want to succeed. The third big lesson I learned is um, in the history of the world, in the history of all mankind, no one has ever washed a rented car. Um, <laughs> and every time I say that, somebody comes up to me and said, I washed a rented car. Okay, you're, you're, you're the exception, you're the exception. No one's ever washed a rented car. No one's ever washed a rented playground. No one's ever washed a rented community. No one's ever washed a rented country. Ownership is everything. And when people feel they own something, whether it's that playground, that school, that neighborhood, that business, that company, they will wash it without you ever having to ask them. I've seen that over and over and over. You give me a kid who owns their own education, a teacher who owns their classroom, a principal who owns their school, and I will give you better results every day of the week. Ownership is everything. I covered the revolution in Tahrir Square in Cairo, and one of my favorite stories was uh, the, the re rebels took over the square, and um, I think the second or third morning, I saw them out washing the sidewalk. I'd never seen that before. I went to school in Cairo, never saw that before. And I interviewed them, I said, why are you doing that? They said, because we own it now. No one has ever washed a rented car. So that's why I write, that's kind of how I learned, those are some of the big lessons I learned. There's just one more set of lessons, and um, it's what I tell my kids. You know, people often ask me, what do you tell your own kids? And, and um, they're really tired of hearing it. I have two girls. And um, uh, my, my daughter Orly started a school in San Francisco. It's called the Redbridge School. And my daughter Natalie is the executive producer of All Things Considered Weekend on National Public Radio. And, um, and, and uh, they're really tired of hearing this, but you're fresh meat. So I'm going to tell you um, uh, what I tell my girls. Because um, uh, I, I got basically a four big lessons for them, which I've told them all their lives. Lesson number one is girls always think like a new immigrant. Who's the new immigrant? New immigrant's a person who came from somewhere often where they are struggling to somewhere they thought there was opportunity. New immigrants, an Armenian friend of mine says, are paranoid optimists. They, they left somewhere bad. Um, uh, they've come to somewhere better, but they're always afraid that they could lose it. And that's why new immigrants 
are full of energy. They know they come to Washington, D.C. There's no legacy spot waiting for them at Georgetown University. They better figure out what's happening in this city, where the opportunities are, get their OODA loop working, and pursue those opportunities with more vigor and energy than anybody else. New immigrants are always hungry. And the first lesson I tell my girls is, always think like an immigrant and stay hungry. Second lesson I impart to them is always think like an artisan. Who was the artisan? Artisan was that person in the Middle Ages who made every, before mass manufacturing, they made everything individually. Every saddle, every stirrup, every lamp, every chair, every piece of silverware, every dress, every shoe, every jacket, the artisan made individually. And what did the best artisans do? They carved their initials into their work because they took so much personal pride in it they carve their initials into their work. Do your job every day as if at the end of the day you want to carve your initials into it because that's a job that can never be outsourced, automated, or digitized. Third, I tell them, think like a starter up in Silicon Valley. A starter upper in Silicon Valley. What, you know, I learned this actually from Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. You know, Reed always says, you know, in Silicon Valley, um, there's, there's only one four-letter word. Um, and it starts with an F, but it's not the one you think. <laughs> the word is finished. If you ever think of yourself as finished, you probably are finished. Ree's motto in Silicon Valley, always think of yourself in beta. Beta is the stage when you build a software. It's about 85% done. You throw it into the community. They work with it, test it, find all the holes. They throw it back. You work on it some more. Throw it back into the community. They look and they work on it. They find some holes, throw it back. Ree's motto is Always think of yourself as being in beta. Never think of yourself as a finished work, because if you do, you really are finished. Fifth lesson is CQ plus PQ is always greater than IQ. Oh, you give me a young person with a high curiosity quotient and high passion quotient, I will take them over a kid with a high intelligence quotient seven days a week. CQ plus PQ, which can be inspired, is always greater than IQ. And lastly, always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, <laughs> my favorite restaurant, okay? So um, when I was researching a book before last, I was back home in Minneapolis, went to my favorite restaurant, Perkins, uh, uh, off Highway 100. At 7 a.m. was early, I was going to the airport, having breakfast with my best friend, Ken Greer. Ken ordered... Um, uh, scrambled eggs with fruit, and I ordered the pancakes. After 15 minutes, the waitress took her order, came back, she put the plates down, and she just said to Ken, I gave you extra fruit. That's all she said. I gave her a 50% tip. Why did I give her a 50% tip? Because that waitress was thinking entrepreneurially. We were basically the only ones in the restaurant, 7 a.m., she's back in the, in the kitchen, and she only controlled one thing. She controlled the fruit ladle. And she said, I'm going to give these two knuckleheads out there a little extra fruit. See what happens, you know what I mean? And lo and behold, I noticed, and I gave her a 50% tip. Whatever you are doing, running a summer playground, running a summer program, always think entrepreneurially. Where can I fork off here? Where can I split off here? Where can I start a new program there? So if you take nothing else away from this talk, Please take this. Always think like an immigrant and stay hungry. Always think like an artisan and take pride. Always think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley and remember that CQ plus, uh, and, and never be finished, always be in beta. Remember that CQ plus PQ is always greater than IQ and always, always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House and be relentlessly entrepreneurial because this Minnesota boy can tell you we all really do live in Garrison Keillor's Wake Lake Wobegon, where all the men are strong, all the women are beautiful, and all the children need to be above average. Okay. So, those are the big lessons I've learned. What did I see? What did, there's a few people out there as old as me here, I think. What did we see, okay? So I think that we were actually here. We were here, we are here for what I call a Promethean moment. So Prometheus was the mythical god who steals fire from a closet on Mount Olympus and gives it to humans to build civilization. 
And we know there are these Promethean moments in history where we get a new tool, a new technology, or a new way of looking at the world, of learning, that don't just change one thing, they change everything. How we learn, how we teach, how we do commerce, how we fight wars, how we build governance. They change everything. We know what they are. They're the printing press. They're the scientific revolution. They're the agricultural revolution. They're the industrial revolution. There's the nuclear revolution. Those were all Promethean moments that required us to change not one thing. They required us to change everything. And I believe we're here for a Promethean moment. Yeah, you know, someone was alive when Gutenberg invented the printing press. And you can bet that some monk said to some priest, now that is really cool, okay? That printing press deal, I mean, I don't have to write all these Bibles out longhand anymore. Oh, we could just stamp them out. Well, you are here for a Promethean moment. And I began to realize this when I woke up one day a couple of years ago and realized I'd written seven books, but they were all about the same thing. I was describing a giant elephant from seven different directions. From the, sometimes from the ear, sometimes from the tail, sometimes from the foot. I realized that I was here for this big elephant and that's what I was trying to describe. So what, what is this elephant? So basically, I, I can explain it to you like this. I, I woke up, um, I do a lot of thinking in bed as you may have noticed, and um, uh, I looked around one day this is about actually seven, eight years ago. And I realized that every political party in the big industrial democracies had blown up. They'd all blown up over the last seven years. The conservatives in England became a Brexit party. They were an international business party. The liberals in Britain just disappeared. In fact, their former leader is now the spokesman of Facebook. How weird is that, okay? The, Democrat, the, the, the Labor Party in Britain really tilted to Marxist. The Republicans became a Trump cult. Democrats are struggling to hold their coalition together. France is the only country in the world with a leader who has no party and an opposition that has no leader. Um, and I, I have no clue who governs Italy today, but I don't, <laughs> think, I, I don't think they're called Christian Democrats anymore, okay? The Grand Coalition in Germany blew up. And all Israel does is have elections now. Every year they have an election because all their parties blew up. Wait a minute, what, something big just happened. How could it be we had the same political parties for 75 years and suddenly they all blow up at the same time? Well, that's because those parties grew out of the last Promethean moment, the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution was such a destabilizing moment when capitalism met the Industrial Revolution, it was so destabilizing that it took us 100 years to figure out how do we construct a politics so we can get the best and cushion the worst out of it. And what do we settle on? We settled on this thing called the welfare state. The welfare state. And it had different versions. It had a Chinese version, a Russian version, a West European version, East European version, an American New Deal version. And what was this welfare state? It was a set of walls, ceilings, and floors that basically enabled workers and um, uh, capital to get the best out of the Industrial Revolution and cushion the worst. And what was left-right politics for 75 years, very stable, was the debate about how high the walls should be. Left said higher walls, right said lower walls. How thick the safety net, the floor should be. Left said thicker floor, right said thinner floor. And how tight the ceiling should be. The ceiling was on income and the pace of change should be linear, not nonlinear. Left said low ceiling, right said no ceiling. And that was our politics, 75 years, that was left-right politics. And then one day, kaboom, the whole thing blows up. What happened? We entered a new Promethean moment. There was a giant release of energy and it blew off the ceiling, blew down the walls and crashed through the floor. What was it? That release of energy were two, there weren't a single technology anymore, they were two super cycles. One was in technology and one was in climate. The technology supercycle was our ability to sense, digit, digitize, connect, process, learn, share, act, and protect. That's cyber. Sense, digitize, process, learn, share, act, and connect. We are now putting sensors everywhere. 
I wrote in my last book about how IBM wired Lake George to, to make this point. They put, they put sensors at every level of Lake George, okay? And that's because John Kelly, the run research for IBM, said to me, Tom, the world has been speaking to us all these years. We just couldn't hear it. We can now hear it. We're putting sensors everywhere. They're in your car, they're in your phone, your GPS. We then connect that data, we process it with AI now, we learn from it, we share from it, and we act on it, and we protect it. That cycle just goes around and around, faster and faster. But what's new about our Promethean moment, it's combined with a environmental super cycle. Emissions, heat, ice melt, warming, sun's hitting the ocean, change in currents, change in air currents, change in ocean currents, extreme weather. We have, we're in the middle of two super cycles that are just going around, and what is unique about them is they get faster and faster all the time as each element improves. And I believe what happened is the two came together and just blew off the ceiling, blew down the walls, and crashed through the floor. And suddenly, these two party systems were no longer fit for purpose. So what do they do? They tend to fall back, I believe, on tribalism and more identity politics, rather than these problem-solving issues. Because they aren't designed to solve them, because none of them can be solved from the left or the right alone. They all require what nature has, complex adaptive coalitions. There was no good time for the world to go tribal. This is a uniquely bad time. Because there is not a single problem we face as a country or as a species whether it's nuclear, whether it's climate, whether it's cyber, whether it's jobs, that we can solve without complex adaptive coalitions. Because what this energy release did was make the world really fast, really fused, really deep, really dual, really open, and really interdependent. Now let me go through those quickly. So it made the world, when this technology super cycle goes around, it just gets faster and faster. And that's about the pace of change and that's a huge educational challenge. You know, when I read about those parents in Hollywood who bribed that guy to get their kids into USC, I actually wanted to call uh, uh, those parents and say, excuse me, excuse me, if you're gonna bribe to get someone into uh, college, could I suggest not USC? Uh, um, um, I mean, no offense to USC, um, but um, uh, could I suggest you bribe to get them into IBM's in-house university? Yeah. Because if I showed you IBM's in-house university, or Infosys's in-house university, you'd be asking me, Tom, who do I bribe to get them into those schools? Because those schools are built not on just-in-case learning, they're built on just-in-time learning. The schools that some of these companies have built, the in-house universities, are awesome, because they're living on the edge. And IBM is competing every morning with Amazon and Google, and they can't wait for the technology department at USC to vote whether they're gonna teach TensorFlow 3.0 this year, okay? They need to grab that technology and then turn it into learning for their people immediately. But what they're now doing, like Northeastern now has a, has a partnership with IBM where Northeastern professors study what's going on at IBM and then bring it back to Northeastern. They have what? They have a complex adaptive coalition. Ain't no left and no right in that story. The world's gotten really fast. It's gotten really deep. You may have noticed we added the adjective deep to everything. Deep state, deep mind, deep research, deep medicine, deep fake. You know, there's no global lexicographer. My wife will tell you when you go to Planet Word, there's no global lexicographer. We suddenly intuited, we added the word deep to everything because we intuited technology was going so deep. We didn't even know where it was anymore. So the old left-right way of governing, I, government, regulate, you, business, innovate, doesn't work anymore when I, government, have no idea where you are. I have this leaked email from Boeing in, in, in my book, and a Boeing engineer is talking about his FAA regulator, and he says, my FAA regulator is so clueless about what I do, watching him watching me is like watching dogs watching television, okay? <laughs> All right? Watching dogs watching television, okay? Um, 
And if you weren't here in this fine capital when the day Orrin Hatch asked Mark Zuckerberg, Mr. Zuckerberg, if you give your product away for free, how do you make money? <laughs> the regulator had no clue how the innovator was even working. And you may have noticed Deep is everywhere. In fact, it, 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 it was in the song that won the Oscars a couple of years ago. It was called Shallow. But what were the words? I'm off the deep end, watch as I dive in, I'll never reach the shore, crash through the surface where they can't hurt us. We're far from the shallow now. Oh, boys and girls, we are far from the shallow now. Technology is going really deep, and you can't govern that left, right. I'll give you an example. I was actually in Israel before the pandemic. I ran into Amnon Shashua, who runs Mobileye, the Israeli autonomous driving company that Intel had just bought for $14 billion. And he said to me, have you ever driven in a self-driving car? I said, Amnon, I, I, just, I was just at Google, and I drove the Waymo car all over Mountain View. California, he said, Mountain View. That's a grid, okay? Try driving a self-driving car in Jerusalem where there are no two parallel streets, okay? So I went up, we got in the car, drove around, up, down, Jews, Arabs, camels, donkeys, all, and nobody's driving. There's a guy sitting there, but nobody's driving. I was blown away. I got done, he told me an interesting story, though, that to test a self-driving car anywhere, in Jerusalem or anywhere else, actually, you need an insurance protocol that determines what constitutes safe self-driving. Well, it turns out the rabbis who run Jerusalem don't know a lot about self-driving cars. So Amnon had to convene a complex adaptive coalition of Mobileye, Volkswagen, their car supplier, the rabbis who run Jerusalem, and the Israeli Ministry of Transportation, and they collaboratively wrote the law. It's so good that Yandex, Russia's Google, now test their self-driving cars in Israel, and China just took the whole Israeli law, translated into Chinese, and made it their law. Who is left and who is right in that story? There's no left right on that continuum. There's just getting it right. It's all there is. Fast, deep, everything becomes dual use in this world. Your toaster has a chip in it, it's dual use. Okay, that's why we're having all these issues with China now. Because in the old days, China just sold us things that were, I call them shallow goods, things we wore on our back, socks we wore on our feet, solar panels we fixed on a roof. We sold China deep goods. Um, things that went deep inside their system, chips, microchips, and software. And then one day, about 10 years ago, China showed up. And by the way, when we just sold them deep goods, and they only sold us shallow goods, we didn't care whether China was authoritarian, libertarian, or vegetarian. It didn't matter at all, because they're just selling us shallow stuff. And then one day, about eight years ago, China knocked on our door and said, yeah, we got this thing called Huawei 5G. And you have no 5G company. And our Huawei 5G is the best company in the world. And we'd like to wire your bedroom and your office and your city and your sidewalk. And we said to them, no way. We don't share values. We can't buy your deep goods. And that's why we're having this huge problem with China now, because they can suddenly make deep goods. The world got fused fused. Today, more strangers are interacting, whether online or personally because of climate migration, with more other strangers than ever before in world history. We're really getting fused. I really had a, a taste of this, um, again, growing up in Minnesota. My, my um, aunt and uncle uh, came back from World War II, uh, and in 1949, they moved to a town in west central Minnesota called w Wilmer, Minnesota. Wilmer, Minnesota, about 20,000 people. And I, I actually visited Wilmer for 50 years. And I became like an expert on Wilmer, Minnesota, visiting my aunt and uncle. At the time, in, when they moved in 1949, Wilmer was 99.9% .9 white, Protestant, Catholic, Scandinavian, and German, and three Jewish families who were the exotic in town, and one was my aunt and uncle. So I would go up to Wilmer uh, during every summer. Around 1975, my aunt came down to the Twin Cities for an event, and she pulled me aside and said, Tom, I was in the grocery store the other day, and uh, I heard someone speaking Spanish. <laughs> Spanish. It was her first encounter with the other, and she never forgot it, and neither did I. 
Well, fast forward, my aunt and uncle passed away and about uh, six years ago, no, it was four years ago now, a woman named Dana Mortensen who has an amazing education NGO uh, uh, in Minneapolis called World Savvy called me up and said, um, uh, would you give a talk for our group? Um, and I said, what's it worth for you? Okay. And um, uh, she said, well, we're working in Wilmer, Minnesota. I said, Wilmer, you set up a tour for me of Wilmer and I'll give you a free lecture. Hadn't been there. So we went up to Wilmer together um, with a, actually a Somali friend of hers. And our first stop was Wilmer High School. And the principal met us in the lobby. And he showed us this world map hanging over the lobby made by the steel company, actually, that was bought from my aunt and uncle. World map, and he told us that the students in his high school, the senior class every year takes out a ladder and puts pins in that world map where every student in that year's senior high class is from. Because Wilmer today is 50% Somali and Latina. The world is fused. And the communities who can build complex adaptive coalitions built on inclusion are the ones that are thriving in Minnesota and a lot of other places. And 45 minutes down the road is a town called St. Cloud, which the Somalis call White Cloud, because they can't build inclusion. And that town is not able to thrive. When the world gets this fused, only those who can build complex adaptive coalitions can make it work. The world's gotten really open. One of us can now talk to all of us. And we can hear each other whisper. We can now hear each other whisper. And we whisper crazy stuff. So that <laughs> that can be a problem, OK? We can now hear each other whisper, and one of us can talk to all of us. And the only way you can protect truth and trust in such a world is with complex adaptive coalitions. Lastly, the world has gotten interdependent. In fact, we are so interdependent. My teacher and friend, uh, Dove Simon, says, interdependence is now our condition. It's now our condition. There's only one question left for us as a species. Will we have healthy interdependency or unhealthy interdependency? Ukraine, Russia today, unhealthy interdependency. A lot of what's going on in our country today, unhealthy interdependency. Either we're going to rise together or we're going to fall together. But whatever we do, friends, we're going to do it together because we are now fused and interdependent by technology, by climate, by economics. The only question is, will we have healthy interdependency or unhealthy interdependency? And guess what the countries and communities have in common that are building healthy interdependencies, the same thing a healthy ecosystem has, complex adaptive coalitions, where business, labor, philanthropists, social entrepreneurs, and local government work together. How do you get healthy interdependencies? You need leaders. And when I say leaders, I'm not talking about the guy who is in the white building with the round room down the street. You're all leaders. We need leaders who, are, who have formal authority, and we need leaders who have moral authority. And what the best communities have in common is they have leaders who put more truth into the world than they take out of it, and they put more trust into the world than they take out of it. Because truth and trust are actually the cement of complex adaptive coalitions. Without truth, we don't know which way to go. And without trust, there's no way we can go there together. And if we can't go together, we can't do anything big and hard, because big, hard things always have to be done together. So let me finish, because a lot of times people say, well, what, what does that actually look like? I want to give you an example of what that looks like. What is a healthy interdependency look like. Can you put up the last slide, please? Keep, oh, I, I guess I can do that. No. Yeah. So this is a town called um, Rogers Forge. Uh, it's outside of Baltimore. And I'm going to explain this picture. I'm going to read you, if you'll bear with me for a couple minutes. Uh, the, see, the Washington Post has a... Um, Regular feature, it's called Inspired Life. It highlights some of the amazing kindnesses that people in the Washington region do for one another that can be enormously impactful, but 
rarely make news. And on December 21st, 2021, the Post ran this story. It started last November with a single string of Christmas lights on a Baltimore County street. Kim Morton was home watching a movie with her daughter when she received a text from her neighbor who lives directly across the street. He told her to peek outside. Matt Riggs had hung a string of white Christmas lights stretching from his home to hers in the Rogers Ford neighborhood just north of Baltimore. He also left a, left a tin of homemade cookies on her doorstep. The lights, he told her, were meant to reinforce that they were always connected despite their pandemic isolation. Quote, I was reaching out to Kim to literally brighten her world, said Riggs. He knew his neighbor was facing a dark time. Morton had shared that she was dealing with depression and anxiety. She was also grieving the loss of a loved one and struggling with work-related stress. The mounting pressures had led to panic attacks. Riggs could relate. Guiding his two teenagers through remote school was draining, he said. Financial angst was consuming, and by the end of the year, he said, I was just beside myself. 2020 was difficult for all of us. A bit of brightness was in order, he decided, but he certainly did not expect this one strand of Christmas lights would somehow spark a neighborhood-wide movement. In the days that followed Riggs' light-hanging gesture, neighbor after neighbor followed suit, stretching lines of Christmas lights from one side of the street to the other. When Lieb Kamasa, who lives on the other end of the block, saw what Riggs had done, she wanted in. I said to my neighbor, let's do it too, she recalled. Before we knew it, we were cleaning out Home Depot of all the lights. <laughs> Quickly, other neighbors caught on. Little by little, the whole neighborhood started doing it, said Morton, who has lived in Rogers Ford for 17 years. The lights were a physical sign of connection and love. She and Riggs were stunned to see neighbors with drills and ladders up on their rooftops and tangled in trees, doing whatever they could, to, to, could do to hang the lights horizontally. They were mostly masked and at a distance, but for the first time in a long time, a feeling of togetherness and light had returned. Hanging Christmas lights horizontally. God, I love that. It's what it's all about. It actually happened. It actually happens every day in the country. You just never know it from the headlines on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else you're looking at today. It's all about hanging lights horizontally, building complex adaptive coalitions. Man, I've just given you a talk all about technology, all about whiz bang stuff. But my real last lesson is actually it's all the old stuff that matters more. Be kind, respect each other, respect nature, respect science. That's what it's all about. All this whiz bang stuff, it, it's just BS. It's all the stuff you teach and learn in Sunday school. That's what matters more than ever. And where do people learn that? They learn it at home, hopefully. They learn it at Sunday school. But most importantly, they learn it in a healthy community, which is why my last book had a theme song. You know, every book, every book should have a theme song. My, mine was um, uh, by Brandi Carlisle, who's one of my favorite singers. And she has a great song. It's called the I, E-Y-E. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. The eye is the healthy community, one that can move with the storm, draw energy from it, but maintain stability at the same time because it has people who are connected, protected, and respected. Connected, protected, and respected. And that's by, because they have leaders who put more truth in the world and more trust in the world than they take out of it. And because they respect science, respect each other, and respect nature. And so that's really all I got to say, folks. It isn't, it isn't real complicated. Mr. Rogers got it a long time ago. Be kind, be kind, and be kind. Thank you very much. <laughs>